Rabbi Ami Hirsch of the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue in New York, and you're listening to In These Times. All of us live under the constant threat of nuclear annihilation. The promise of mutually assured destruction has been an effective deterrent since the first and only time nuclear weapons were used in war. But lately, in these turbulent times, the nuclear specter again looms large. And this summer's blockbuster film Oppenheimer reignited public moral debate about the threats posed by weapons of mass destruction. Joining me today is Kai Bird, a prolific author and celebrated biographer who won the Pulitzer Prize for the biography American Prometheus, The Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer, which he co-wrote with Martin Sherwin. Their book, American Prometheus, served as the basis for Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer screenplay. Kai, it's a pleasure to have you as a guest. Welcome to In These Times. Well, Rabbi Hirsch, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. What stimulated me in particular to want to speak with you is uh, over the summer, I uh, saw the Oppenheimer uh, movie. You're, you and your co-author, uh, Martin Sherwin, uh, wrote a monumental book and the definitive history of uh, Oppenheimer. And after I saw the film, I was uh, inspired to read the book. And I want you to know, I read all 600 or so pages. I, there's another 100 pages of footnotes, which I didn't read. Well, that's the best part. <laughs> Uh, so, first of all, congratulations. It's just a magnificent biography, and I hope people read it. And well, thank you. Let me ask you, first of all, did you like the film, and were you consulted? Did you have an official role in the film? Uh, I was consulted, but, you know, I have to say it's Christopher Nolan's film. He's a brilliant director. He wrote the entire screenplay all by himself, initially on spec without even touching bases with me. The People who had the film option managed to get the book delivered to him in March of 21, and he read it and fell in love with it. He didn't call me until September of 21, by which time he had a very long first draft of the screenplay, and he was about to sell it to one of the studios in Hollywood. We had a terrific meeting. He's a very smart man. He took all my questions about what was in the script and what wasn't, but he wasn't going to share the script with me initially. He'd like to work confidentially. And, you know, authors notoriously can be very troublesome. <laughs> <laughs> they have that reputation in Hollywood. <laughs> but he wrote the screenplay based on your book, right? It's entirely based on American Prometheus. And four months later in February, he called me back and we had another meeting, and he escorted me into a Greenwich Village hotel and handed me the script and said, here, you know, take as long, as many hours as you need to read it. It was still confidential. I couldn't take any notes. I couldn't take phone pictures of it. It took me four hours to read it. And I was blown away. It's entirely based on the book, and it really captures the key moments in Oppenheimer's life as depicted in American Prometheus. Mm -hmm. I think it captures the personality of Oppenheimer and, you know, his rise and downfall. I saw the movie about six weeks before its official release. He flew me out to Los Angeles and escorted me into an absolutely empty IMAX theater to what he thought was the best seat in the house, right in the middle and walked away to the end of the aisle and gave me privacy to watch this all by myself. And, you know, it, it was an emotionally moving three hours for me because it does, as I said, capture this incredibly complicated life, the enigmatic qualities of Oppenheimer, his intensity. But it, it, it's also historically accurate. In large measure, there are some, you know, scenes that are imagined dialogue, but I recognized a lot of the dialogues that came straight out of the book. I was very pleased with the movie, and I got up at the end of the film, and I walked over to Nolan and gave him a hug and whispered in his ear that it's brilliant. Then I turned to his wife, Emma, who was there, who was his producer, Emma Thomas, and I said somewhat facetiously, you know... Most authors always say that the book is better than the film. My fear as the author is that in this case, the, 
people are going to walk out of the theater saying, that film is much better than the book. <laughs> the book is monumentally amazing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? You came in in a later phase after Martin Sherman had done much of the research. Is that right? No, that, that's the sad story about the film is that we learned from Nolan that he was going to be making the film in late September of 2021. And I had that meeting with Nolan. And then I took the train back down to Washington and reported to Marty, who was too ill at that point to come up to New York to travel to meet Nolan. Sadly, he died two weeks later. So he died knowing that the film was in the works, but he's no longer with us, which really I'm very sad about because he was a wonderful guy and very funny and he had a wry sense of humor. And he really would have enjoyed the rollout of the film and all the hoopla surrounding its release. Marty started the book in 1980. He signed a contract with Alfred Knopf. And he was a terrific history professor specializing in the Cold War and nuclear weapons. He worked on the book for 20 years, gathered 50,000 pages of archival documents, did 150 interviews, went to every archive possible, got 8,000 pages of FBI documents. And, you know, he in the process, he sort of got biographer's disease, <laughs> which is when you're convinced as the biographer that you know, there's at least one more interview you need to do before you can start writing or one more archive you need to visit. And he finally came to me 20 years into the project in the year 2000 and asked me to join him. What did he think you would add to the project? He knew he needed someone to jumpstart the writing. I'm somewhat prolific. <laughs> And biography takes a long time, any biography. He persuaded me. He actually, he said, if I failed to join him on this project on Oppenheimer, his gravestone was going to read, he took it with him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, initially I, I told Marty I liked him too much to become a co-author because co-authorship can be very fraught with controversy and big egos and, but this turned into a terrific collaboration, and I started to write the first chapter on the childhood years. And as I wrote, that stimulated Marty to write, and we went back and forth. And he knew the material so well, and there was really no more research that needed to be done. But it still took us five years to write and publish the book. So it came out in 2005. You know as much about Oppenheimer as any person uh, alive today. What is it about Oppenheimer that was so fascinating to you, and why do you think it's still relevant to us today? He's a really complex, mysterious character as a human being, a quantum physicist who had a near nervous breakdown as a young man at the age of 22 in Cambridge, England. And in that episode, which is depicted in the film in the so-called poison apple incident, you, you see, you know, a young man who's vulnerable and fragile and in crisis. And somehow he transforms himself and overcomes the crisis and then discovers quantum physics. Yet he's not just a, a nerdy scientist. He's someone who's always interested in basic questions of human philosophy and so he reads literature, you know, he became a fan of Ernest Hemingway, he loved the poetry of T.S. Eliot, he wrote poetry himself, he acquired a curiosity about spiritual Hinduism, so much so that he taught himself Sanskrit so that he could try to read the Gita in the original, which inspired, by the way, one of his close friends, Isidore Rabi, another physicist, to say that perhaps Api, as he was known, would have been a better physicist if he had studied the Torah more than the Gita. <laughs> I love that. That really struck me because Isidore Rabi, who was also a uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist and worked on the uh, Manhattan Project, he came from a traditional Jewish background. He said, why not the Talmud? Yeah. Which is so Jewish. That is such a Jewish comment from somebody who was raised, you know, in an intense Jewish environment. Well, Izzy Rodney was, as you say, he was 
very connected to his Jewish roots. And Oppenheimer was not. He was aware that he was Jewish by ancestry, but he was raised here in New York City in the Ethical Culture Society, went to the Ethical Culture School. He was, you know, very secular. You go into that in some detail about the impact that the Ethical Culture School had on him and the ideology of its founder, Felix Adler. Do you think that the values and principles that went to the founding of the school and that were conveyed in the students, did those values impact in an important way on Oppenheimer's life? Oh, absolutely. As I understand it, the Ethical Culture Society is sort of, it's an offshoot of Reform Judaism. And it's sort of a secular religious organization that was determined to sort of teach ethical values to their children. And Oppenheimer was raised very much in that milieu. And his father was a German immigrant who fell in love with America and all things New York and married a woman of German ancestry, both Jewish. They were interested in books and art and, and, you know, Oppie's mother was an art collector, a painter herself, and they made a small fortune. And so he was raised in very privileged circumstances in a 10-room house on the Upper West Side. And he had a maid and a cook and a chauffeur-driven limousine and a nice sailboat, which he sailed on the Long Island Sound and a summer house. You know, this was New York privilege at the turn of the century. His mother, you know, was an art collector and acquired several Van Goghs and Picassos. So he grew up with all this fabulous art in his apartment. He was privileged and protected and ethical culture. They had exercises and ethical questions about labor issues, and they were constantly challenging in the curriculum their students to think hard about ethical choices in a modern world. Oppenheimer was very much influenced by it. And that generated his lifelong love of exploring different cultures, different philosophies. Well, I think so. And it explains why he was a polymath and Mm -hmm. not just, you know, why he was interested in the physical world and exploring science, but that he wasn't limited by that. He was interested in, you know, really deep questions about human existence and morality. Is that unusual for a theoretical physicist? Do you find a lot of uh, scientists who are interested in everything? You know, I think a good scientist has to be more of a polymath. I mean, Albert Einstein was interested in larger issues of war and peace. And alas, I think there's been a tendency in you know the last couple of generations where science has become so focused and so narrow that there's no time to explore human societal issues. That is a limitation, I think. And a good scientist has to be, should be someone like Oppenheimer or Einstein or Isidore Rabi, who are in touch with their roots and curious about history and interested in philosophical issues. Was it clear that he was an exceptional intellect already at an early age? Yeah, he was quite bright. You know, there's a funny story in the book I recall where he's, I think, 10 years old. He had acquired quite a rock collection. He already had an interest in chemistry. He wrote a letter that seemed quite knowledgeable to a local New York City meteorological society. They thought this was uh, an interesting letter, and they invited the author of the letter to come and give a lecture. (laughs) He shows up, and he's only 10 years old, and they have to get a box for him to stand on at the lectern. He was clearly very bright, a prodigy. And he was a little, you know, he was so bright, he had to learn eventually how to tone down his obnoxious side. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a story in the book I love where he turns to, I think this is when he's like 13 or 14, and he turns to a a young girl in his class and says, sort of boastfully, ask me a question in Greek and I'll answer you in Latin. (laughs) (laughs) He graduates from ethical culture. He's excelled in chemistry. So he goes to Harvard. He graduates from Harvard in three years, studies physics, but mainly chemistry. 
and decides he wants to be an experimental physicist, and he goes off to Cambridge, England. He's very young, and at the age of 21, 22, he suddenly, for the first time in his life, he faces his failure. He's awkward in the laboratory with his hands. He keeps breaking things. He doesn't have the patience to sit in the lab and watch the test tubes drip. <laughs> so he makes mistakes. This leads to a, a crisis. And I think there was also sort of just a general psychological crisis of some sort. We call it the poison apple incident in the book. And we spend many pages trying to explore what happened. But it is a mystery. Something happened that caused him to go into crisis to such an extent that the Cambridge authorities either put him on probation or almost expelled him. And his parents had to intervene and promise that he would be taken to a Harley Street doctor, a psychiatrist in London. In your view, that was the first time in his life that he actually wasn't as good as some other people in what he was doing. Yeah. And it led to a crisis. You know, the film tries to capture this. At one point in his relationship with Gene Tatlock, the director of the film has them in dialogue and, and has young Robert talking to Gene Tatlock, explaining that he had a psychological crisis when he was a younger man, and she's studying to be a psychiatrist. And uh, she quips to him, well, you needed to get laid. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of, I mean, you know, there, there's a truth to that. That's not in the book, but it's sort of suggested by the biographers, I have to say. And he had some degree of social awkwardness, but at the same time, he had a magnetic charisma about him, too. Well, he acquired this. He transformed himself again and again. When he got his PhD in Göttingen, Germany, he decides to go off to Berkeley, California to teach Initially, he's a terrible teacher. He's, he can't lecture, he mumbles, and gets criticized by his students for this, and he, he learns. That's true of what happened when he was chosen to be scientific director at Los Alamos. He had had no administrative experience, but he transformed himself into a fabulous administrator. And likewise, socially, he really did love people, to be around people. He was just awkward initially. But he acquired this just magnetic personality. Women were attracted to his looks, but also the way he spoke. He had this unusual mid-Atlantic, sort of upper-class aristocratic American accent, not a Boston Brahmin accent, but <laughs> not a British accent. But he spoke very softly, articulated every syllable, very soft-spoken so that people around him would sort of lean in to make sure that they caught every word. So, yes, he was very charismatic. So he was selected to oversee the Manhattan Project, which was the American effort to build the bomb, especially in the light of suspicion that Germany was ahead of the United States during World War II. And you put in the book that one of uh, his students at Berkeley said something like, this man couldn't even run a hamburger stand. And yet he was selected to run the Manhattan Project of the highest historic necessity for the United States. H how did that come about? Well, it came about by accident in a way. General Leslie Groves, who was the military commander of the Manhattan Project, had just finished building the Pentagon. He was trying to figure out how to put together this project to build what they called the gadget. He went around the country interviewing prize-winning, Nobel Prize-winning physicists and other scientists. Sort of at the last minute, he interviewed Oppenheimer in Berkeley, and he was mesmerized by it. He was only 38 years old, Oppie, at that point. Groves, I think, was impressed that unlike the other scientists he had interviewed, Oppenheimer could talk to him in plain English. He obviously was extremely ambitious and charismatic. He saw that spark in him. He could see that this was uh, someone who was highly motivated to produce this gadget precisely because of his politics that were very left-wing by the late 1930s. He was very close to the Communist Party, and Groves knew this from 
FBI files that began to accumulate in 1940 when Oppenheimer was put under off and on surveillance, even you know two years before he was selected for this job. Um, J. Edgar Hoover of the FBI was you know keeping a list of potential subversives, and Oppenheimer ended up on this list starting in 1940. He always denied he was a communist, right? He denied that he was ever a formal member of the Communist Party. His FBI filed some 8,000 pages. There's no smoking gun that proves that he was ever ever someone who paid formal dues or took out a party card or submitted himself to party discipline. But you can see in the FBI records that he knew all sorts of communists. You know, his brother had joined the party. Kitty Oppenheimer, the woman he fell in love with eventually and married and was his wife until he died, was a very ardent member of the Communist Party for about four years. He had all these associations and he gave money as much as $400 a year, which is a sizable sum in the 1930s, to various causes sponsored by the Communist Party, like desegregating the public swimming pool in Berkeley or buying an ambulance to send to the Spanish Republic in the midst of the Civil War. And Groves knew all this. And Groves knew all this. Before he asked him to head the Manhattan Project. I think so, yes. And certainly he took a serious look at the FBI file before he actually hired him. Why do you think he hired him anyway? Because of all the other qualities? Because of all the other qualities. And an important thing is that in their first meeting, Oppenheimer, and this is depicted in the film quite well, Oppenheimer suggests to Groves, you know, what you need to do to build this gadget is bring all the appropriate scientists, the physicists, the chemists, the engineers, in one place. And I know that you're concerned about security, so bring them to an isolated post, surround it with barbed wire, build a secret city for them to work in where they can freely exchange information and you can guarantee good security. Do you think, I don't know if this is even a fair question, do, do you think that had Oppenheimer not been in charge of the Manhattan Project, would the bomb have been built roughly in the time frame that it was built? Well, it's hard to answer that theoretically, but Marty Sherwin interviewed all these Los Alamos veterans, and every one of them would say, you know, it, the bomb, the gadget never would have happened in two and a half years like it did if there had been anyone else. He was not only a good administrator in that he understood how to manage these big egos, like Edward Teller, for instance. But he understood that you had to let these scientists argue amongst themselves and make free associations. Typically, Oppie would stand at the back of the room and not interfere and let people talk and explore things. And then he would step forward just at the right moment and in a brilliant, calm non-threatening fashion, he would summarize what everyone had been saying. And it would become obvious to everyone in the room the way forward, the next step to solve this problem. A lot of the physicists were Jewish. Do you think that was just coincidental or was there something about Oppenheimer who, would, who wanted these people around him or, or that's just what Jews did in that part of the century? It's a combination of all those things. You know, in the Jewish tradition, in the ethical culture tradition as well, there's a great value put on education. And so, not surprisingly, at a moment in the decades of the 1920s and 30s when there's this exciting new science called quantum, any number of Jewish physicists emerged, like Oppenheimer, who uh, wanted to plow the fields, you know, that Albert Einstein had first plowed. Then, of course, uh, Hitler sort of shot himself in the foot, so to speak, by expelling so many Jewish intellectuals, including any number of Jewish physicists. So there were many U Jewish European scientists who came to America and ended up on the Manhattan Project. And they were motivated to finish the project. Well, this is Oppenheimer's motivation, of course. He had studied in Germany. He knew Werner Heisenberg, who was 
his opposite, so to speak. Heisenberg was the head of the German bomb project. And he knew that Heisenberg was just as capable as he was of building this thing. And he feared that the Germans were probably winning the race, and he feared that they could win the war. This was his worst nightmare. And that turned out to be false, right? It, they were far from building the bomb. They were far behind because they had either... This is very interesting, and I, I'm still debating this issue myself. They either took a wrong turn. You know, Heisenberg made a mathematical mistake about what was necessary to take fission and transform it into a gadget that would explode. But, you know, there's also an argument by Thomas Powers, who was the biographer of Heisenberg. This book came out 20 years ago, but Powers makes a pretty persuasive argument that Heisenberg was incapable of making the mathematical mistake that he's accused of making, and that instead he was just quietly sabotaging his own project because oh, he didn't want to give it to Hitler. That is very fascinating. And, you know, you may recall some years ago, Copenhagen, the play, came out to explore exactly this question. So we, I don't know, it's a mystery. But it's also true, you know, that Oppenheimer famously said that no physics was invented during World War II. It was all done in the 30s. By 1939, they knew fission was possible, and therefore they knew that theoretically, at least, a bomb was possible, a big bomb. It just was a huge engineering problem, and it took some money, investments of time and people, and it cost $2 billion in you know, 1942 dollars, which was a lot of money. But you know, famously, Oppenheimer also, after the war, said in a public speech, he says, you may think this weapon was very expensive. It's actually very cheap. And any country, however poor, that decides that they want to acquire these weapons will be able to do so. There are no secrets. It's a you know, matter of building a factory to do it. So he's predicting North Korea and Pakistan and India and Israel and maybe tomorrow Iran. And he was predicting this in 1945. It's incredible. So let me ask you about the whole issue of nuclear proliferation. And Oppenheimer is very well known after the war as being an advocate of arms control. But when Germany had uh, lost the war and they had completed the bomb after Germany was already defeated, is it correct to say just that Oppenheimer was in favor of dropping the bomb on Japan? Is that accurate? Well, yes. <laughs> he developed the gadget, tested it at Trinity in the New Mexico desert in July of 45, and in effect handed it over to Henry Stimson, the war secretary, and General George C. Marshall, and President Truman, and they made the decision how to use it, but he was party to some of those discussions. One of the physicists at Los Alamos, Robert Wilson, a friend of Oppenheimer, is close to him, was so troubled by exactly the question that you, you're raising, you know, Germany is defeated, why are we now working on this terrible weapon of mass destruction? Wilson actually called for a meeting at Los Alamos for the scientists to come and debate this issue, the future of the gadget and civilization. And Oppenheimer didn't prevent it from happening. Many people came and argued vociferously, and he stood at the back of the hall and then finally came forward in his typical fashion and said, well, I just want you all to recall that when Niels Bohr, the famous Danish physicist and father of quantum, arrived in Los Alamos, he had one question for Oppenheimer. He went up to him and he said, Robert, I just want to know, is it big enough to end all war? Oppenheimer used this argument to persuade successfully, to persuade his, his scientists to continue working. And the argument was, if we don't demonstrate to humanity the terribleness of this weapon in this war, in a dramatic fashion, then the next war is almost certainly going to be fought by two or three nuclear-armed adversaries, and it will be Armageddon. Oppenheimer felt there was no 
And I think he was right about this. There's no military target large enough to hit with an atomic bomb. Therefore, that left a city. And he went along with this. And yet he was painfully aware of the human consequences, the tragedy, the fact that it was going to be civilians who would become, the, in large measure, the victims. After Trinity, the successful detonation, he was quoted as saying, I have become death, the destroyer of worlds. But he took an active part in targeting Japan. He was consulted about how to drop the bomb, under what conditions, where it might be most effective. Did he evolve only later, after the war, to being an opponent of nuclear proliferation? Or is it partially myth that he said, I have become the destroyer of worlds after Trinity? At Trinity, when he saw the successful explosion, either he or Frank, his brother, turned to each other and said, it worked. Not very quotable. Yeah. You can imagine, you know, this is the culmination of a lifetime of enormous exertion. And I, I would think, just on a personal level, there would be pride of success, right? Oh, absolutely. He was very proud of what he had accomplished, the fact that it had worked. But a couple of days later, after the Trinity test, a New York Times reporter who was assigned to the project to write in a classified way, you know, not in real time, he interviewed Oppenheimer and, and asked him, well, what did you think when you saw the explosion at Trinity? And that's when Oppenheimer, and this is characteristic, he could be very theatrical and dramatic. You know, he'd been studying the Gita, and he pulled out this quote, I am death, destroyer of worlds. The biographer in me believes that he did not say that at Trinity, but, <laughs> but he understood that the reporter needed a good quote, and he, he managed, to, managed to come up with it. But to answer your a larger question, did he evolve? We know that he was worrying about the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki before it ever happened. We know this in part because I did an interview with his last secretary, Ann Wilson, who I was still alive and living just down the road in Georgetown near my home in D.C. She told me this story. She says after the Trinity test, she was walking to work with Oppenheimer one day. And he suddenly started muttering to himself, those poor little people, those poor little people. And she stopped him and said, Robert, what, what are you talking about? And he says, well, the gadget works now. And now it's going to be used on a city. And the victims are going to be civilians, women and children. What's interesting about this story is I go back to Marty Sherwin and I say, you know, Marty, isn't this a great anecdote. And he says, well, what makes it even more interesting is that Marty realized that that had to have happened in the same week that Oppenheimer was briefing the bombardiers who are going to be on the Enola Gay to drop the first atomic bomb. And he was instructing them at exactly what altitude the bomb should be released and detonated to have the most maximum destructive effect to kill the most people. So this is a complicated man who's capable of holding these enormous contradictions in his head, deep empathy for the victims, and yet he's determined to make it happen. The world is awash today in nuclear weapons. Do you think humanity is living on borrowed time? Yes. <laughs> Can you elaborate on that? Some people will argue that, you know, it's been 70 over 75 years since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Therefore, deterrence is held. We haven't used these weapons again. And maybe they've prevented numerous big wars. My response to that is that 75 years is not really a very long time. And the story is not over. It'll never be over. We're still learning how to live with these weapons. They're very dangerous. And human beings are very dangerous and accidents are possible. And we've had some serious near misses, like the Cuban Missile Crisis. I think Oppenheimer understood immediately the consequences, the moral dilemma of these weapons, but he knew that you can't stop science, you can't not invent fission, and these things are gonna happen, but human beings are capable of creating 
laws and means of regulating this technology. And so after the war, within months, he was going around making speeches, calling these weapons weapons of terror. And we need to ban them. And we need to create an international atomic authority that would regulate the technology, would have sovereign rights to inspect any laboratory, any factory, to make sure that weapons are not being used out of atomic technology. And to benefit from the development of atomic energy, he was a proponent of using you know, the peaceful atom, but he wanted to ban the weapon. And of course, this is what got him into trouble with the government, and this is why he was put on trial in 1954 and eventually publicly humiliated and destroyed. So he's very complicated, and his, this story is very relevant to our own times. He's prophetic, I would argue. He's offering a warning to us about the dangers of these weapons, and I think more people should be paying attention, and we've gone too complacent. Kai, I want to thank you for this time that you spent with us. What are you working on now? Uh, you really don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but after spending six years with the very decent Jimmy Carter, I felt strongly that I needed a change of pace. And so now I'm working on a biography of Roy Cohn. Oh, wow. From Jimmy Carter to Roy Cohn. Yeah. And, you know, he's very much a scoundrel, <laughs> legal scoundrel, famous lawyer, aide to Joe McCarthy, a lawyer to the all five mob families in New York City, and famously Donald Trump's lawyer for many years. It's a very colorful story, and I'm having fun with it. I want to thank you very much and looking forward to reading uh, your next book. Thank you, Am. Thank you. I'm grateful to Kai Bird and Martin Sherwin for writing American Prometheus, a monumental accomplishment that brought J. Robert Oppenheimer to life. The profound questions addressed in real time during the rush to build the bomb still haunt us today. At the center of these dilemmas is the relationship between science and humanities, technology, and values. Oppenheimer was among those relatively few scientists who continually emphasized that science needed humanities to better understand its own character and consequences. It's why he studied and mastered a huge range of philosophical, literary, and poetic works. At the Princeton Institute he directed after the war, he hoped to create a haven for scientists, social scientists, and humanists, interested in a multidisciplinary understanding of the entire human condition. Many fellow scientists at the Institute strongly disagreed with Oppenheimer's perspective and resisted his efforts. They wanted to do pure science, pure mathematics, where there is only one correct answer, rather than to be weighed down by the messiness and imprecision of the humanities. But we now know, or should know, that Oppenheimer was right. The very technology that has liberated humanity and brought so many gifts to modern life, can also lead to the destruction of everything. We are the first human beings capable of exterminating the human race through scientifically engineered weapons of mass destruction or ecological catastrophe. Science gives with one hand and takes with the other. Our increasing reliance on technology has made us increasingly vulnerable to technology. C.S. Lewis wrote, Each new power won by man is a power over man. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. We give up our soul to get power in return. But once our souls, that is, ourselves, have been given up, the power thus conferred will not belong to us. We shall in fact be the slaves and puppets of that to which we have given our souls. If a man chooses to treat himself as raw material, raw material he will be. If I have sold my soul to the machine. The power I receive in return does not belong to me. Google, Facebook, Amazon are the masters of what I do with my life. I am merely the raw material. Even if I'm just bored or surfing YouTube, the algorithms determine what I will watch, how I will spend my time. The algorithms influence what I want and what I buy. Nowadays, algorithms even choose our life partners. We believe we have the capacity to resolve any ailment, physical, emotional, psychological, or sociological. We assume that there is a scientific explanation to everything, and hence 
a scientific solution to every problem. The meaning of life is not a philosophical or religious problem. It's a scientific one. And we now have science-based solutions. We can invent our way out of the existential anxiety most of us will feel at some point in our lives. But how empowered are we, really? How many hours a day do most Americans spend watching a screen? Are we even able to resist its hypnotic hold over us? Is that empowerment or servitude? Nowadays, people walk the streets, their heads buried in a phone called smart that makes them so dumb that equally distracted drivers often run over them. If space aliens were to visit us from a distant planet, not knowing anything about the human race, would they conclude that we are the masters of the screen or that the screen masters us? They would surmise that this device must have some mesmerizing grip over human beings. We can't pull away. Is that freedom or servitude? And they accuse religion of being the opiate of the masses. It seems to me that many more people are much more addicted to Google than God. The sad truth of the human condition is that while we have advanced rapidly in the realm of science, we have advanced slowly in the realm of morals. The profound failings that drove the Hebrew prophets to moral fulminations plague us today as well. Science is morally neutral. We are no more honest than when Moses brought down the tablets millennia ago. In fact, we may even be less honest because the temptations are greater. Technology has made it so much easier to cheat. A hacker can break into our bank account without leaving home. The damage inflicted from such a corrupted soul could be many times worse than in pre-technological eras. Our lack of moral progress means that we are constantly at risk of destruction. Morality, not technology, is still the key to a peaceful and productive world. The more we advance technologically, the harder we must work to preserve, protect, defend, and deepen the sense of human grandeur. We are much too confident in our knowledge. We know a lot. We know incomparably more than we used to. But that's all we know. We don't know anything else, which is most of what there is to know. While embracing progress, while marveling at and making use of the brilliant achievements of science, we return time and again to those age-old principles and values that were carved out of the stone of antiquity and anchor all human life. Nothing better has been invented since, and nothing ever will be. Love your neighbor as yourself. What is hateful to you, do not do unto others. Honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not take bribes. Speak the truth within your heart. Be faithful. Be loyal. Protect the stranger and the weak. Relieve poverty. Free the captive. Redeem the oppressed. Let the slave go free. Be compassionate. May the law of kindness be on your tongue. Pursue justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Until next time, this is In These Times. Thank you.